Christ. Amen. I mentioned earlier, uh, we're in the year of Matthew. Matthew. This is uh, Rembrandt's interpretation of Matthew, what he looked like. And uh, there's somebody else with him in this picture. Did you say the Holy Spirit? How did you know that? Oh, you're pointing to your dad. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a... Uh, an angel or a spirit or the message of the Holy Spirit whispering, helping him, okay, write this down, remember this. Now, looking at Matthew's expression, uh, what do you suppose is going on in his community of faith that he's thinking about? What could be happening in that early, those early years of the church? <clears throat> he's not the first gospel written even though it's the first one in our New Testament, it starts with Matthew, but actually Mark was written first. And uh, Matthew includes a lot of what, uh, what Mark has, almost all of it, but he had some other ones too. He had some other uh, parables and, and different references. Well, Matthew's church had a problem. The problem is this, that soon after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, they were dealing with a sense of embarrassment caused by the delay of the return of Jesus. This is a picture of uh, the ascension, the angels coming up. This is right after Jesus ascended into heaven. And uh, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Well, people were saying, he's, he's, he's coming, yes, very soon. And they, would, uh, they wanted to know how soon. And so they, uh, they, they calculated after this time, and they wanted to figure out uh, when precisely he would return, and they told they told their neighbors and friends, "Yep, any day now, any day now." Uh, and they stood on tiptoe, waiting and waiting and waiting. And something happened—a strong sense of uh, skepticism from some of their friends and neighbors had started to set in. Uh, by Matthew's time. It had been a good while since the crucifixion of Jesus. Some say 75 years later, 80, 90 years. Uh, and that's a long time to stand on tiptoe, waiting. And to make matters worse, uh, other, other people, uh, the, the, the non-believers, started taunting them, saying, what's all this talk about Jesus coming again? We, we don't believe it. Prove it. Show it to us. You've had your noses pressed in the glass for so long that your faces are permanently imprinted there. When is he coming? And so some started to uh, wonder themselves, is this, is this really going to happen? Is this a thing? And so uh, it started to settle in with kind of a, a laziness, a, a lethargy where you get same old thing, same old thing. Now, you can only wait so long before what First Peter says, or, or Second Peter says. Second Peter. In the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and indulging in their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It's the same old thing. It's the same old thing. Nothing's going to change. This Jesus whom you worship, this Jesus who you, who you claim is raised from the dead, he's never going to come. And so it started to, to pull on the edges of the church, to rip at the fabric that held it together. If the church decides they're wrong about this, how else are they wrong? What else are they wrong about? And uh, who knows whether it's true. Uh, that's where some of the issues that Matthew is dealing with. Uh, 
those were very real issues. St. Paul had the same had the same uh, issue too when he wrote uh, First and Second Thessalonians, those were great first letters. Uh, he says, "Don't consider God this, this is slow. Uh, God being slow, like he forgot, uh, he's given us more time, and it was an issue uh, that, that a lot of Christians were worried about and started falling away from the faith. And again, this sort of skepticism uh, was eroding uh, Matthew's church. Does anybody know what insignia this belong? What group this belongs to?" Boy Scouts. Yeah. Be prepared. Be prepared. The meaning of the motto is that the scout himself, by previous thinking out and practicing how to act on any accident or emergency, so that he is never taken by surprise. Be prepared. Jesus said, You must be ready, you must be prepared. For the Son of Man is coming at his an unexpected up. If, if 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 the owner he uses an analogy of a house being broken into, well, if the owner knew what time the thief was going to come at night, he would have stayed away. So, like that owner, or he should have been like the owner who waited. You got to be awake. Don't fall asleep. Christians should always act, says Matthew, as if the coming of the Son of Man is imminent. And as far as figuring out timetables and speculation, uh, Jesus said, about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only for the Father. And there, he's, he's uh, repeating what Mark said in his first gospel. No one knows. Trying to figure that out, trying to calculate, uh, it's not gonna work. You're gonna be wrong. I remember the story of a seminary student he, uh, he was at seminary and he was going to quit. So he went to the dean of students and said, you know what, there's not enough time, Jesus is coming soon. I want to be out there preaching the gospel. I don't have time to study. And he says, well, I, I admit, I uh, applaud your, your enthusiasm to, be, uh, to, to proclaim the gospel. Uh, but I want, I want to, meet me, meet me on Wednesday, this is like Monday. I want to show you something. And he took him to the, uh, the rare book room of the seminary. And the rare book room is like a, down in the basement, it's, a, it's two, two floors down. And he showed him a, a collection of books, they're about, this, about as wide as, as the altar up here, the long, old books, really old. And he pointed at him and he said, each one of those books on that shelf have two things in common. Each one of them tells, predicts, when Jesus is going to come again. And the other thing they have in common is what? They're all wrong. They're all wrong. These are ancient books. Everyone was absolutely convinced. They had the timetables figured out. They did all that. Don't, don't go after that stuff. Don't fall for that. He thought about it. He continued to, continued his studies. Went back to study. Went back to learn. And he didn't know at all. In fact, the more you, the more you study, the more you don't know, right? Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. I'm not as smart as I thought. About that day and that hour, no one knows. So we began the, this church year in the beginning of Advent, and, and uh, there's a music station, I forget what it's called, but it's, they're broadcasting what now? 24 hours a day. Christmas music. We're all into it. It's, it's Christmas time. It's Christmas Eve. We set up our tree. We got our lights on. And, uh, you know, it's that time of year. Uh, but we begin uh, this time of the year, this Advent time, uh, with this reminder, yet again, uh, to, to prepare. Not just for Christmas, when, he, when Jesus comes as a baby, but when he comes again as King and Lord. Keep living as if it's going to happen. Keep awake. Be prepared. I got an email from a friend of mine. I haven't heard from him in about eight years. And 15 years ago, I started teaching him how to fly a plane, and he, and he just stopped doing it. And eight years ago, he says, yeah, I moved up to Alaska. And I'm living up there. I said, oh, okay, that's cool. Kind of wondering if he's going to fly again, you know. He was Robert. And uh, I got a text from him on Wednesday, just a couple days ago. 
He said, hey buddy, I just, I just bought this, this, to finish my license. <laughs> uh, what's that behind that plane? <laughs> An iceberg. I mean, this is a glacier. The guy's going to learn how to fly. He wants to fly in Alaska. And I'm thinking, boy, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to learn how to be careful around that stuff. And those have those big, ton they're called tundra tires. You can land on gravel riverbeds with those things. They're a lot bigger than they look. <laughs> they're all ball, ball tires, big, bouncy, and you can land on boulders. Uh, but you have to be prepared. In fact, the state of Alaska requires all of this if you're going to fly in the state. <laughs> That's the statute. An airman would not make a flight inside the state with an aircraft unless emergency equipment is carried as follows. Look at all that stuff you got to bring on each plane. I talked to a pilot and asked us, if you carried all that, you'd have to have a 747 everywhere you went. All this cargo, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's a rule. Why did the state of Alaska make this requirements? Why do you suppose, Bennett? So that if they crash, there's safety equipment. So their passengers will be taken care of. Uh, every one of these regulations, they say at the FAA, Every rule is written not in ink, but in blood. Somebody died, and so they made a rule to prevent people from dying, so that they didn't freeze to death or not have enough blankets, or, or somebody had a blanket, the pilot had an extra coat, but none of his passengers did. Well, they said, look, we got to make sure if you're going to fly in Alaska, even in the summer, it can get cold. Look at all that mess. Interesting. I hope he learned. I hope he continues on. He's ready to do it, and uh, we'll we'll see. He said, "Well, let me. If, if, I might need to look at your records." Uh, what do you say? My my flight bag got all wet, so all my stuff is is soggy. So uh, I might need to call you up. I said, "Hey, no problem, no problem." But anyway, uh, the good news is that we don't have to buy all that stuff to be prepared. <laughs> we can still live as if. The coming of Jesus is given. We can be prepared. We can keep awake. We can lay aside the works of darkness. Even when the rest of the world is going, whatever. Just do your own thing. It's life is short. You know, you, you hear all those phrases. I saw a bumper, a bumper sticker. It was a billboard. It was right in the highway. It says, life is short. Buy a cabin. Anybody seen that? Remember seeing that? Yeah. Well, life is short. I should buy a cabin. Well, nothing wrong with having a cabin. But you can, get the, you can get the idea that just do whatever you want. It's, it's all, all that matters. And Matthew's saying, not so. Not so. We know that life is uh, precious, uh, unpredictable, and for those reasons, it's precious. But the promise uh, is that we are created for more than just wondering and worrying if we're going to miss out on something. He promised to be with us. The promise doesn't insulate us from the difficulties of living or the difficulties of life, nor does it prevent us uh, from an uncertain future. But the promise does mean that we do not face this future, no matter how uncertain it can be, by ourselves. Uh, this is the day after uh, or Easter evening. Easter evening, on the way to a place called Emmaus. Two people thought the world was over, Jesus is dead, and it's all come to nothing. There's nothing else left. And who shows up and walks with them? Jesus does. He shows up and he walks with us. Amen. Okay, please stand now. Let us continue.